Father, we thank you for the privilege of today. Thank you for your servant, Pastor Janda, and the team from GPRC that uphold the day in prayer. We thank you for every one of them. We ask you, Lord, to have your way in the atrium today, in the political sphere, in the economic sphere, the social sphere, as the world keeps the tailspin to the end. We know you are the only reality. Keep the heart of your servants in you. Cause us to be strong and stable, unshaken by the things that are being shaken across the world. Father, continue to teach us, feed us with your word, grant us understanding, empower us by your grace. Cause us to walk in the experiential reality of what you teach us. We pray therefore that all over the world, the evangelists will arise. Those who are hiding in caves like Elijah, those who are running away like Jonah, you will cause them to get back on track, stay on their lane. Let them leave the office of pastor alone, the office of prophet alone, the office of apostle alone, the office of teacher alone. Father, cause them to esteem highly this extraordinary office you place in the body for the expansion of your kingdom. Father, we pray that the communication of your word today will bring life and light to your people. Lord, we pray for every nation that is going through political turmoil. Father, by yourself, uphold the heart of your remnant. We pray that before the end comes, prevent the people of the world from destroying each other. Have your way, Lord. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. And Holy Spirit, we trust you right now to communicate the mind of the Father. For Yeshua's name we are prayed. Amen. Amen. Men and brethren, we are grateful to our Father in heaven for the privilege to receive from him the ongoing teaching on the fivefold. For those who are coming for the first time, we have been studying the fivefold in detail. However, no matter how detailed we are, it's not as detailed as what is in the book, the fivefold apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. And that book is available free of charge online. You can download it at www.kingdombooksclub.com. The Father told us not to sell anything. Except where people want the physical book, then we put some money printed then to recoup the money and have a little to keep it going. Otherwise, everything we do in this commission is available free of charge. The reason being, because to whom much is given, much is expected. You have no idea what it is that the Father elected us from a small city called Uwere, somewhere in the rainforest of eastern Nigeria, and gave us multiple assignments. One of them is to network his remnant, which is what we do in International Business Fellowship, and then to provide resource for the entire body of Christ to transit from theater, where you come to watch a performance of a man or woman, to school, where people go to learn, they teach, where there is teaching, training, equipping, activation, and release. So at the Melchizedek priesthood, the priesthood of all believers will arise all over the world. And he has given us the curriculum for that, which is made available to pastors and leaders worldwide. We see, even if you are running a widow's ministry, an orphan ministry, you are running a young people ministry, you are running a church ministry, implement the teach, train, equip, activate, and release paradigm. It will become a living church. It will become part of the body of Yeshua. It will be the Omega Church. And so the Father has also committed to us, Pastor Grace and I, to personally teach some people nine months every year when the mentors bring in the pastoral and other virtue into their life we together take them through a process called the Global Advanced Mentorship Program of Authentic Kingdom Culture, where authentic kingdom culture is imparted directly to the people. Then the 24 7 line and, globe, and the day break with the king in the mornings, get the saints to pray. Frontline intercessors, 24 7, every single hour, somebody is praying for the remnant, praying for the critical things of the day out of London. And on out of nowhere in Nigeria. I can go on and on. But the point is this. It's such a huge undertaking. Why would the Lord choose us? We are conscious that we are not qualified by any means. It is His grace. If it is His grace, then we have a duty of care to Elohim. 
to be faithful to the vision. We have a duty of care to every brother, every sister, to do everything possible within our capacity of grace to make sure that no brother or sister connected with us misses it. And no ministry or congregation connected with us misses it, but they'll get it right. And that's why Arise Metropolitan Assembly in London is simply a laboratory. We don't regard it as normal church. It's a laboratory. These things the Father teaches us where we practice them live. So that if a pastor wants to see, if an apostle wants to see, you can come to London to impact home church in the London borough of Havering and be with us for a week and see how we are transitioning to that organic church, that organism, where we have ministers who have been trained, who have been released, yet working together. They've not followed the allure of those who want to do their own. We say, let's see the fivefold come alive in us. So men and brethren, please, we you got to know that when we share these things, please don't take offense at us. This is the way we receive it from the Father. He's strong. At times, even a human instinct is to moderate the thing, then we remember the danger. Release the word as the Father gives it. And so please, those who get offended and are angry, please be here with us. We do not preach our word. We do not teach our word. That's why we give the biblical references in everything we do in quantum, the way the Father gives you so that you can check us out. And we say to people, we are open. Please, if you spot any error, or erroneous application of the word, draw our attention to it. I'll be the first person to repent. Pastor Grace will be the first person to repent. We give the word so that you can check us out. Men and brethren, let us dig deep into the word. Let's stop skimming the surface looking for promises to throw like firecrackers at people. The depth of the word is real. In this earth realm now, if you are not being built in the world, you are in trouble because trouble has come upon the world. The world is not the same. It's been going on for some years, but since the year 2000, it began to go through a nosedive, and that nosedive has turned into a tailspin. The world is indecent. It has not yet hit pay bottom. Ground zero has not yet been hit. And so right now, the only reality is the Lord. The only reality is his kingdom. The only reality is his word. Be rooted in the word, you can never be shaken. And I want to encourage you. Embrace the truth. Don't run away from the truth. Don't resist the truth. Don't try to play games with the truth. Don't handle the word of Elohim craftily, taking what appeals to you. A.W. Tozer of blessed memory of the Church and Missionary Alliance in Chicago who died Several years ago, I think it was in the 60s or so, whatever it is. You know, he said, when you see a smiling picture, a smiling scripture, look closely. You'll find a frowning one. Many people want the smiling scripture. So when we're teaching on these things, there are some who just want to hear the nice things. And the things the Father wants to say, they want to switch off it. Today, we're going to speak lesson. The, the first lesson today is going to be the evangelist, part three, science privileges and pitfalls. Then when we finish, we look at the next lesson. Also an evangelist, then we round it up today. Tomorrow we'll go to pastor. And after pastor, we'll go to teacher. Men and brethren is the entire fivefold. Each one will look at what it is. We'll look at the pros. We'll look at the cons. We'll look at the overall picture. These three names, if you are called to any of these fold, I encourage you study the entire fold before you zoom in on your own. So that way you know how your fold interconnects with the other folds. So when you run your lane, you will not cause other people to stumble. You make room for other people so that the fivefold can truly emerge. The plan of the Father is that in every city, the fivefold will be functional, tapped into by the church in that city. And ideally, every local congregation should be open to the ministry of the fivefold. Otherwise, they will be less than fully nourished. Have you said that the evangelists Part three, signs, privileges, and pitfalls. What are the signs of the evangelist? What is it that you see in anyone, any minister, any brother, any sister, as a pastor? Once you see it, you know that this one is called by the Father. Number one, the first sign is a deep and unquenchable test for many sinners as possible to come into the kingdom. It's a raging fire to see people being saved. It doesn't matter where, in the mall in the shopping district. It doesn't matter. Schools. 
anywhere and everywhere. It, 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 an unquenchable is deep, is, is from within. It's a sign, a sign number one, so to say. Number two, for this reason, evangelists do not bother much about doctrinal findings. They, they don't bother. They leave that to apostles and uh, pastors and teachers to take care of. They don't bother. They don't want complications. All they know is that for God so loved the world, for Elohim so loved the world, and he gave his only begotten son. All they want to know is that if you believe in your heart and confess with your tongue, so they don't bother about all the nuances of doctrine, about salvation, about the kingdom and all that. They don't get into those details. Number three, evangelists tend to keep the gospel message so simple that many religious folks often flinch in disbelief. They say, wow, is that all? Have you ever seen Rahan Bonke minister? He can take one little thing, boom, he's preach a powerful message. Hundreds of thousands get saved. Then the signs and wonders follow. He'll always preach salvation first. So they keep it simple. When you see a brother, you ask him to give exhortation to the brethren. He keeps it simple. He takes just one scripture. And through that scripture, it begins to lead people to conviction of sin, of repentance, and of judgment. You've seen somebody who you should watch closely. Number four. Evangelists can convey the love of Yahweh to sinners with remarkable clarity and ease. They carry the heart of the Father. So they do it with ease. It's not something they struggle about. It's grace walking through them. Remember that all the fools and all gifts and callings is actually our vessels in the hand of the Holy Spirit to show up. The showing up, 1 Corinthians 12, 7, but the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with us. What does that manifestation mean? It means the showing up. So whenever Holy Spirit shows up through people in a way that they make the love of Yahweh so simply available to sinners, no struggle, no judgmentalism and all that, you've seen somebody with that. Number five, evangelists have extreme disdain and distaste for church politics and strive for positions. They have distaste. They don't like church politics. All these committee who will be in the board of trustees or who will be the next uh, chairman of the finance committee, they have no, they, they have, it's just not in them. They can't see why people will leave the work of the Lord so as perishing and you are doing politics in the church. Number six, evangelists love being on the road in the open. Go ye is wired into their persona. They love being in the open. They love being out there. They love being reaching out to people. They love meeting people. They love travel. It's inside them. It's not by them. This is not a soulish thing. It's a spiritual thing. It's coming from their spirit realm. Number seven, signs, wonders, and miracles often follow the ministries of the evangelists more than the other fold in everyday life. Because it's a promise in Mark 16 that these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall, you know, all those promises take off, cast out devils, heal the sick, all those promises, they are more manifested for those who go ye. When you go ye, things happen. This also applies to all the folds. Apostles who sit down, little happen. If you go, things happen. Prophets will see that it will happen. If you go, much things will happen. Even pastors and teachers who sit down, not much will happen. But if you are open to go across your normal boundaries, you see that it's stretching to the twist snap, and there will be manifestations. They happen. I mean, one of the ministries that happened in Italy was absolutely mind-blowing. It was not the normal thing. If I was sitting the normal thing, I wouldn't do that. But here was a place I went to minister, and before I began to minister, the father spotted her through pe three people who apparently had been living in, you know, a, a less than desired life. And I don't want to say more because we try to protect identities of people. But the father spotted that and dealt with that before we even began church. Would I do that in the congregation that arise? Most unlikely. But the unction was so heavy. The body was so heavy. These ones, I want to break the yoke of iniquity before we even begin. And men and bread, it was dramatic in the extreme. <clears throat> so what am I talking about? So evangelists who, because they go here, signs and wonders attain their ministries much more than the other fool. Number eight, they seem to have more raw faith than the other fools. More raw faith. 
Because of that go ye mindset, because of that passion for souls, there seems to be more raw faith at work in them. And they impart it to the people also. Men and brethren, it's so important we realize this. Then what are the privileges in the office gift of evangelists? Let's talk about four or so, you know, a few privileges. Number one, they bear most the passion of the master to seek and save the lost. It's a privilege to bear it more than the other people in who are leaders, who are the other people in the ministry that body to seek and save the lost. In Luke 19, 10, they bear it more. They carry it on their way, on their chest, in their heart. So number two, they are more filled with joy than the other ministers. And this is because there is great joy, as Luke 15, 7 says, there is great joy in heaven among the angels over one sinner that repents. So because the Lord uses them more to bring sinners to repentance, evangelists bubble with joy. If you see true evangelists always smiling, there's always this joy of the Lord. We're not talking about happiness coming from money or new clothes or new perfume. No, we're talking about something. There's an effervescence about their life that is so radiant, it's so infectious. We are around them. You can hardly be gloomy because they bring sunshine that dispels darkness. Number three, they exercise the spiritual liberty to make the gospel simple and unclutter with, you know, dogmas of men. It's a privilege. Number four, in the process, they are more sinner sensitive than the other fivefold. They are more sensitive to sinners and they need to get them saved than apostles, than prophets, than pastors, than teachers. Men and brethren, that's why they carry the heart of Yeshua a lot more. I know, I know many, many other folks will argue this. But the reality is people have to be saved before you can empower them. And they do that more. And for them to happen, they, need to, they are more sensitive to the fact that it doesn't matter the sin. You see, uh, other folks can afford, especially pastors and teachers can afford to, even kind of great people and see how we take care of them. Apostle, uh, evangelists don't great people. As far as they know, sin is sin. So whether it's a prostitute or a liar, whether it is a, a serial um, uh, um, you know, thief or one who does anything you consider tiny, for them, sin is sin. So they just go to the root of the matter. The soul that sin that shall die. And so they, they begin to really convey the love of a father. Now, what are the pitfalls of evangelistic ministry? What are the pitfalls of, the, of, of this office? Number one, they can become so fixated with, with keeping the doors of the kingdom wide open for as many as possible to enter that they unconsciously or consciously begin to play the numbers game. So, 20,000 came to that meeting. 10,000 came to that meeting. Did they check out to give such fifty figures? No, they're careless. They just take the decision cards handed to them and they announce, oh, this number of people got saved today. How many were saved for the first time? They are saved times you hear, you know, some of these mega uh, evangelists, uh, you know, say, oh, this number of people came to uh, the Lord in their ministry. Oh, one million came there. Uh, five people came there. I mean, 500,000 came there. When you check properly, those who were saved for the first time, maybe 10,000. The others are believers that money was given to pastors to mobilize their people. And then the star power of the preacher is causing the people to just come closer. So they'll come close to the stage. So they can play the numbers game because of that zeal. And that is dangerous. Number two, try to help Yeshua by lowering the entry bar into the kingdom. You see, when Yeshua check Yeshua's ministry, it's always go and sin no more. There's no question of, oh, you just want to make it simple, then people come and they remain there sin. No, Yeshua brought them to a state of conversion, change of mind, go and sin no more. So the danger of uh, one of the pitfalls of apostolic ministry is in the bid to get people in. They may want to help they lower the bar and they just say, oh, believe in God, believe in God. And before you know, one minute, they lead people to prayer, nothing happened inside. It's just the charisma, the star power of the evangelist that drove them to make those things. And at the end of the day, they were truly not saved. Number three, some evangelists tend to take prophets of old as their role model rather than Yeshua. So you see, these kind of evangelists, they will never preach the love of the Father like Yeshua preached. They will never preach a normal message. They will never preach loving, caring message. They never draw people to come to the Father 
they will come like the prophets of old. They will zap into a place. It's about doom and doom and doom. And all they do is pump fear into people and use fear to raise the emotion of people. Out of fear, people run to the altar. Nothing happened in their heart. No change in their heart. So that's the danger. Yes, fear may lead some people to make decisions of eternity. But generally, fear is a deficient method of conversion because if the fear is not real, if it was just fear of uh, torment and it was not real to receive the love of Father, it may not be skin deep. Number four, tendency to stage expensive crusades. You find this among the modern, rich, wealthy evangelists, those who have, you know, have many supporters that can give them money. They say, we're going to do a crusade in so and so Muslim country. People bring 10,000, 5,000, 20,000. And at the end of the day, they go out and stage the expensive crusade. The stage alone is what almost half a million strobe light, lighting, all that, all the expensive ground, everything. By the time they finish, doing all that. The true evangelist the Father has called, when they look at the cost involved, they, they, they draw back. When the Father has called them, I call them to be an evangelist, their frame of reference is that man, and for that reason, they don't answer the call. So that expensiveness of the crusades becomes a counter benefit. It has a counter effect. Number five, some ev evangelists have turned gospel meetings into religious equivalents of show business. I came from a background of show business. All the glitz and the glamour and all that stuff. So some people, you go to meetings, they say they're having a revival. You go there, oh, the latest band, singing pop, you know, basically it's much like a rock band. The only difference is the lyrics. And if you, are, if you have an experience in show business, you know that the power of music is in the, it's not in the lyrics, it's in the beats. It's in the arrangement. And so what they are singing is more or less what you see in any rock concert, in any disco take or whatever popular song. They just change the name Jesus and put uh, Kevin and all that stuff. No, some crusades you go to them. You don't know whether you are in a show business. The glaze, the glamour, the strobe lights, the neon lights, all flashing, all flashing. They say, hey. And then the greatest act of music in the, in the, in the town, they, they hire that person at great expense. No, that spiritual transactions of eternal value are to be transacted and you are feeding the soul, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life. At the same time, you want to do a spiritual transaction of turning sinners to saints. Those things, they don't mesh together. Number six, neglect of family. There's also the danger that some evangelists, because they imbibe with this need to go in, they imbibe with this need to touch and bringing as many as lost, they can literally forget the family. No two ways about that. Our loyalty to him must be first. But then let's remember that the father has, marriage is a choice. If you want to be celibate, praise the Lord. Paul decided for celibacy so he will not be bogged down. He was an evangelistic apostle. So if you now go to marry, then you know you have obligations to your wife, you have obligations to your children that so invest in making sure that the upkeep of the family, the needs of the family are provided for. The children have what they need, and that is important. Number seven, some evangelists neglect their own souls. They are too busy chasing souls, they forget their own. They don't know when a little lying comes. A little uh, twisting of record of people who came. Before you know it, one little lie becomes a permanent lie. And all they do it, before you know it, some of them, they get drawn. Oh, that wonderful looking son or brother or that wonderful looking sister. Before you know it, they are just drawn into iniquity. Neglect of the soul. Whenever the soul is neglected, somebody may be busy in the Lord's work. And at the end of the day, we see Paul said, in verse in 1 Corinthians 9, 24 to 27, Know ye not that day which run in a race, run all, but one receiver the prize. So run that you may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we are incorruptible. I therefore, Paul said, so run, as not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beat the air, but I keep under my that by any means, after 
When I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Every evangelist should take this to heart. What is the point that you have been used is going to hell? What is it that you say, oh, I did this in your name and first say, depart from me. I don't know you. You're a work of iniquity. So every evangelist must guard your own soul. And you're able to have real passion for other people. And number eight, there is also the danger of celebrity pursuit. Because evangelists by nature, you know, are effervescent and they reach out and they are in the outdoor. There's also the danger that they want to be rock stars and celebrities and, and be you are not the person. Your job is like an MC to introduce them to him, to show them him. But when you now begin to want to be a celebrity, you want your name. And in this modern world, you want your faces on billboard. And some ministry, you must do this number of billboard, this number of flyers, this number of posters. And what is on the billboard? Half of the billboard is the face of the man. Where is Jesus? No, is the man. Come for your miracle. Is the man. Come for your this is the man. They are beautiful wristwatch. They are beautiful visage. They are tired. They look hench. Where is Yeshua? No. Come. For, you know, then they take wheelchairs. They take uh, all these things. You know what? That is terrible. Because you are shifting focus to yourself. And you may block the ability to see him. Number nine is gift projection. Gift projection is projecting your gift as greater than others. Projecting it. And so some of them cannot stay in a church. They are just, you know, difficult and all that. They are projecting their gift. One of the projections is to tell everybody what I do, you can do it. Everybody can do it. It's not true. Not everybody can raise the dead. Not everybody can heal the sick. Not everybody can do miracles. But some will do it because it's the body. The gift is to the body. You can read that out for yourself in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 28, 29. Daddy, not everybody can do everything. The Father gives it to whom he will. He decides the gift he wants to show up. So don't project your gift. Then number 10 is comparisons. Comparisons. You know, because there's a lot of flow of the anointing, some evangelists tend to compare themselves with a pastor and invite them to preach. And before you know it, they just try to sneak in that they are superior to the pastor. They sneak in. The Bible says, this sign shall follow them that believe. And if he's not following anybody, then he'll not, you know, check your call. They make snide remarks. No. Gospel work is complimentary. Come with those gifts and callings. Come with those signs and wonders. Be humble and fitting. Otherwise, you are walking a ten line. Then the level is the danger of soulishness. Soulishness. Most times evangelists tend to be a little too, you know, broken when they are not recognized. They are not, uh, uh, they are not fulfilling that dream, that expectation. They get soulish. They get sore. They get oh, offended. The soulishness is dangerous. Also feeling inner abrasions and wounds because of rejection is soulishness. I will say to some people, get the ministry of inner healing and deliverance for your own good. Otherwise, if you carry those things to preach with them, you may preach death rather than life. Number 12, taking offense when sinners, they let Yeshua get blessings that they didn't get. They led them to Yeshua. They prayed for them. Yokes are broken. They get walking their miracle. Themselves, none. At times, they don't know it's a test. And they get unworried, they get offended, they begin to question Elohim. Number 13, the danger of inviting people to meet them rather than Yeshua. This is a great danger. And let me say this, evangelists, your assignment is not to people to meet you, it's to meet Yeshua. It's not even to uh, bring about the increase in the attendance of the church, it is to increase the kingdom. And the Father by His Spirit will determine where to place them according to what he knows of the people. So if you are too besotted with bringing more people into the church, you might miss the reality that is to the king and the kingdom yet to introduce them. Having said these things, let's go on to the very next lesson. And that's the last one for the Office of Evangelist. And number one thing we want to discuss is the transition that can happen in the life of an evangelist. An evangelist can transit in the Bible, transition is so real. You saw the case of Philip. The deacon in the church in Jerusalem serving tables so that the apostles will consider the ministry of the word. You know what? When the apostles and the church in Jerusalem went into maintenance mode and all they were doing is eating and drinking and all that, forgetting the going mandate, 
the Lord allowed persecution to come. As he ran to Samaria, Acts 8, Philip alone became an instrument of turning Samaria to Yeshua. Why? Because the father transitioned him from deacon in the top heavy, full of apostles, Jerusalem church and elders. There in that raw territory, he was unshackled. He became an evangelist, transitioned by the Lord. And you know what? Because he knew how to keep rank. When that great revival came, he didn't say, let me start Philip and Sons Evangelistic Ministries. No. He sent for the, he told the elders in Jerusalem, come and see Samaria, which the Lord told us, from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the most part of earth. Samaria has received the Lord. And they sent Peter and John to confirm the church. And you know what? He could have settled down to now disciple them. But knowing his calling, he obeyed the Lord and went away to Azotus. There he made Ethiopia eunuch, the treasurer of the kingdom of Candace, the queen of Ethiopia. And from that conversion, the gospel went to the uttermost part of the earth. So a man who was serving tables was transitioned to be instrument of taking the gospel to Samaria and uttermost parts of the earth. So people can be transitioned to the office of evangelists from various levels and various other assignments and that's why in Arise and what we recommend in the Global School of Ministry, generally ordain people into ministry and let them go and prove their ministry. So from that ministry, after one, two, three years of serving as ministers, if they are called to be apostles, it will show. Called to be prophets, it will show. Called to be evangelists, it will show. Called to be pastors or teachers, it will show. So when you see a young man want to start from the top, you know pride has come in. Transitioning happens in the kingdom. Except those who are called and it's so clear and they have called and it's so clear and it's a need of that food in the house, then you confirm them. But when it otherwise, ordination after doing the school of ministry is to be first and foremost a minister. In the, in the global school of ministry model that we say to the churches, do that and give them some time to prove their ministry. Lest they carry titles without fruit. So what are we saying also? In the same way, apostle, I mean evangelist can also be transitioned. An evangelist can be transitioned, yes, to be an apostle, can be transitioned to be a prophet, it is possible. But they are not transitioned to be pastors and teachers. It's often that other way, prophet and apostle. And it will be so clear because the fruit of what they have done is so clear. Men and brethren, Let's also now take note that when you humble yourself, the Father can lift you up. But there are also three levels of maturity in evangelists. We start, they start as baby evangelists. Baby evangelists, they preach salvation. That's what they know. They don't even know about the kingdom. They preach salvation. Okay, but they feel a lot of pressure to do signs, to do miracles. So they can finish ministry, they want to lead people to healing, and then they spend two hours because they want to bring the Holy Spirit down, and they don't know where they miss it. They'll put, ask, put music, and all kinds of things. They try to conjure him, so to say. He's not conjured. He's not a spirit of the other type. But you have to conjure him. He uses you. He chooses when he wants to show up. And so evangelist, please, if you have been in the baby state, know it. If you are easily offended that people didn't receive you, or you preach and some people didn't repent, you get angry, you get offended, or you go to a revival and things didn't happen the way you want, you begin to blame them, it's because of your sin, it's because of that. That signs of babyhood, immaturity. Grow up. The second level is the maturing evangelist. These are people who preach salvation and by the grace of Elohim, they will preach a measure of the gospel of the kingdom. That's to say, they give the whole context that leads people to submit themselves wholly to the king also, to start a walk with him. Now, the flaws in baby evangelists may not be fully seen here, but they have not fully arrived. They are still growing. Then, number three, they are mature evangelists. They have grown. They are strong. They are stable. They've been to the paces. They know that that all the people they preach don't receive the gospel, don't receive the good news, does not necessarily mean that they have failed. No. When you mature, you know that there are some people the Father will send you, as we told you the other time, according to 1 Corinthians 3, 
that all you are doing to them may be to just clear the ground or break the ground. Nothing more. And another person will be the one that will plant the seed. And even you may preach to people, other people have already broken the ground, you are planting the seed. And there are people you're preaching to, other people broke the ground, other people planted the seed, and your job is to water it through the word you bring to them. And if you ever have people you're going to preach to, other people have cleared the ground, broken the ground, planted the seed, watered it, and your job is to harvest it. And you discern by Holy Spirit where people are. Mature evangelists have great discernment. They can see. And so some people think they are prophets. No, these are revelatory gifts. That doesn't make them prophets. They have discernment. They can see clearly. They can see the state of the heart of people. They can see and know the message that are best going. So even if they prepare the message, as they go to the pulpit and look at the people, the Lord can open their eyes to see where the people are and give them the very message that will bring them the greatest number of them to repentance. So more mature evangelists are more stable. They are not moved. They are not rocked by winds and circumstances. And they will know that when they do the work, the Lord is he who gives the increase. So they do the part given to them. So let me also, let's also discuss something the Father wants to clarify. Evangelist and pastoral work. The evangelistic anointing is not suited for pastoring. It's not suited for nurturing the flock. It's an anointing for going out to bring in the lost into the kingdom, not for sorting, not for nurturing. It is not. But throughout history, we see evangelists leave that work. Many of them, starting from the most prominent right now, among them, they leave the work, they start a church. And what, if you check very well, it is tight offering. Because they don't trust the Father will provide to fulfill the ministry. I will say to them, look to the example of Rahan Bonke. He fulfilled his ministry. He's now retired. He handed over his ministry to Daniel Kolenda, Christ for all nations. Fulfilled his ministry. He's about 79 now. He lives in Florida in retirement. And he does some vocational work. I think he's an example of a man who fulfilled his ministry and trusted the Lord and the Lord provided for him to do a work no other person has done in this generation. No other. Many of you know Billy Graham. You need to know what the Lord used Ryan Bonke to do in the third world. It's massive. Preeminently, I believe he's been the evangelist of the day. So, brethren, a situation happens where a lot of people are feel the pressure. Oh, they're rejected. Oh, they don't have enough people. They want to start their own church. And they try to say, God told me. God told me. On the last day, the books will be opened. Every idle word hey, will come before people. And to use the name of Holy Spirit to say, Holy Spirit said I should start a church. Hey, will he contradict the word? The answer is no. Stay in your fold. But however, listen to this. There are situations where the Lord may indeed ask an evangelist to start a church. What are the circumstances? You went to do a crusade. There's no living church there to hand over the souls to. The Father may ask you to start something for them. But how do you know it's of the Lord? You start that, you get the Lord to do it or a church or brethren the Father will send to come and nurture the sheep. And you are willing to do that because you don't see them so as your own. It's the Lord. You are a mere agent of bringing them into the kingdom. So these are the two things. That you planted the church, yes, but you are willing to hand them over so the people can nurture them better so you can fulfill your calling of being on the go. The second thing that can happen where there is even nobody rising up yet in the interim from that congregation or no church that has people that are, can be sent there is that the evangelist who the Lord has used to start this emergency work, you know what? Connects it to a church with the fivefold or pursuing the fivefold so they are aligned so that the congregation in this new plant can draw grace when people are sent from the other church, you know, with other folks to nurture, to make that place where he's connected. That way, there can be a temporary remedy until the time when the father would fully transition the work. So it is so important that evangelists do not miss it. So they can, the circumstance is very simple so that we do not miss that pastor. You already have a major case on the day of judgment. Already. 
already have a case. When you come before the judgment seat of Yeshua, you might escape hell and lake of fire, but for rewards. All that will come from that ministry, you won't get any rewards because you did it out of your own flesh, not by him. So men and brethren, while we are alive, we can make difference. We can make, we can, we can truly make preparation. That's why Global School of Ministry, like went to Italy, two ministries are starting the Global School of Ministry so that people can be empowered. They've seen the need. They've seen the need and they already said that they're going to do it. And it's so wonderful. You know, we went to Manchester, you know, a ministry there, we started the Global School of Ministry and we are good. We are using our own apostolic grace to help pastors to see. Don't sit on people. Don't sit on gifts and call it. Open up. Take this thing. Teach them. Train them. Equip them. Activate them. Release them. You will lose. We use the example of our rights to teach them. You lose nothing. You gain all. You have less hassle. You have less hassle. You know what? I'm 62 this year. How many more years do I have? Two thirds of my life has been lived. By the grace of the Father, this is the last one, dead part I am on. And so we do everything possible by every means, internet, boots on the ground, everything across the world, all continents, to make sure that every believer and every ministry and every congregation is assisted to be in empowerment mode. And for that to happen, we say to people, stay in your lane. Do the work you are assigned to do so you can operate with grace. By grace, not by struggle, not by works. Men and brethren, this is so simple, so uncomplicated that we don't know why people find it difficult to get it. But I believe that some evangelists called here will get on the road and just turn souls into the kingdom. Your primary goal is not to stuff the church with people, new people. It is to turn people into the kingdom. And the Father knows who he can handle it better in terms of nurturing them. But one thing is certain, if you go bearing precious seed, weeping, planting, sowing, you will doubtless come with your shifts again. And by the law of sowing and reaping, the Father knows the congregations that are involved in Goyi, he will add to them such as he will. And the grace of the Father will be fulfilled. And the churches will grow, not by ABC methodology, attendance, building, cash, but by kingdom methodology, where Yeshua says, I build my church, the gates of hell shall not prevail. It's the other sheep I have, who are not yet on this soul, fold. Them I will bring in, John 10, 16. And that's what he's doing. He is best at adding to his church those he will. He is best at transiting people from darkness to the kingdom of light. Men and brethren, I hope you've been blessed by this teaching on the office of evangelists. And if you've been blessed, why not let us know? Share with us so that we can know that we were able to hit the mark and we will improve next time. If there was anything we didn't cover, please feel free to ask a question what we didn't cover and we will answer you. But you know what? The Father loves you. The Father is gracious. The Father wants to increase his work. If we do his work his way, we're not going to be stressed out. You see, the reason why I'm able to do most of what I'm able to do across the world by his grace is because early the Lord taught me, leave pastoral work alone. So all this time we've been in the UK, and even before then, the Lord has me focused on prayer, downloading, distribution, and I'm looking forward to it. It's in that light that when the Father brought people like uh, teacher Stephanie Foster to handle administrative things, praise the Lord. They, you, know, uh, you know, praise the Lord. So I focus. I'm not bogged down. I'm excited with my lane. I run my lane as an apostolic teacher. I run it. I tell you, I wake up anywhere, anything the Father, any door to empower any congregation. For the sake of a congregation of seven, I can travel, fly many miles fly for a congregation of seven because not me it's his grace at work in me it's not pastor grace it's the grace at work in her what we do once you discover your fold stay in it stay in it there was a time the global school of ministry was just pastor grace and the children when i traveled but we didn't give up we stayed on today across the world in only 12 years the Father has glorified himself. What the Father has given to you, avoid the temptation of going to do what your flesh wants. 
The flesh always works opposite to the spirit. And it's contrary to one another. And if you follow the flesh, the fire of his glory will burn one day. Men and brethren, let's embrace the truth. It sets free. Let us know how this message, four lessons on the evangelist has blessed you. Are you called to be an evangelist? What will this message do to you? Do you want to know more? Send us an inbox. Write to us. Email. VisionaryMail7 at gmail.com or send us an inbox on Facebook. Let us discuss how we can help you. We're soon going to be launching some boot camps called International School of Missions and Evangelism and Discipleship. Boot camps in different regions of the world. Whenever that comes, we will invite those within the area for impartation. We have this strong conviction that if evangelists arise and take their place, the work of the Lord will be fulfilled a short space of time. Please distribute this message extensively and also go to Authentic Kingdom Culture Live on YouTube. Subscribe and watch the program on YouTube. We don't know what Facebook is doing against the gospel. Well, you know what? We'll manage until when the Lord will tell us that it's up, game up. If it's game up, we'll migrate away. For now, let's see whether they can change their ways. We love you dearly, brethren. I will pray right now. Father, we thank you for your word. Your word is true. Have your way. Every evangelist who is listening to this recording or the live presentation, I pray that there will be something that will quicken in their inner man. They will never rest on the same things that drain the anointing for bring men into the kingdom. Father, I pray that all pastors will have the confidence to allow evangelists space to do their own work of revival and work of increasing the kingdom and they will not put on due pressure on the evangelists to bring people to church and begin to speak unadvisedly against them. Father, I pray you provide for your evangelists. Those you have called, provide for them to fulfill the go ye mandate. All of them, my Father, we thank you for evangelists Edwin de Beniro in Lagos who is such an example. Lord, we pray that you help him to go forth and do the work and trust that his wife and the other leaders can take care of the church. We thank you for every evangelist. We thank you for evangelist Ryan Han Bonke. Thank you for the example he is. Lord, strengthen him. Lord, bring perfect healing to his physical body. As you visit him to heal many, we pray that he will discover a touch from the stripes that will bring total healing to him. Keep him alive to see the fruit of his labor. Bless Daniel Colenda, who is now in his stead. Lord, we pray that all your people will do that which is right in your sight. Lord, have your way. We seal these prayers with the blood of the Lamb. We thank you for answering our prayer. In Yeshua's mighty name we pray. Amen.